It's a personal and professional honor for me to, be, to introduce tonight's speaker, Nobel Laureate of Literature, Orhan Pamuk, whose fiction and cultural politics are focal points of my own work. I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this campus visit possible, the Duke Trinity College Dean's Office, the Office of Global Affairs, the North Carolina Consortium of Middle East Studies, the Franklin Humanities Institute, Ames Presents, and the Duke University Middle East Studies Center. The two public events <coughs> that we'll be planning today and tomorrow at the National Museum at 1.30 would not have been possible without the support of directors, chairs, and staff and the supporting units, and particularly the administrative work of Stacey Wies of Ames, Griffin Orlando of Dumesk, and Rohini Thakar of OGA. Orhan Pamuk is a foremost practitioner of the global novel today, writing with a focus on Turkish culture, history, and politics, while mixing multiple genres from the historical novel to romance and the detective story to the political novel and autobiography. With intertextual allusions <coughs> to Turkish and world literature, common tropes in Pamuk's work include the double, identity, aesthetics, unrequited love, Sufism, conspiracy, murder mystery, and the everyday power of the state. Most of his work is set in Istanbul, Turkey, the former capital of the Ottoman Empire. His first novel, Cevdet Bey and Sons, is a three-generation late Ottoman to contemporary Turkish Republic saga. Pamuk's first three novels recapitulate techniques of literary form, from realism to modernism and to postmodernism. His fourth novel, The Black Book, is an urban palimpsest of 1970s Istanbul that holds a cult status in Turkey. My Name is Red is a historical murder mystery centered around Ottoman Islamic book arts. And Snow focuses on contemporary coups and conspiracies. At times, Pamuk's characters are one-time leftist intellectuals who struggle with the rise of a new neoliberal order or Islamist politics. He often writes with a strong tone of loss, which he describes as huzun, a form of collective melancholy that creates its own belonging. His first seven novels earned him the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2006 at the age of 54. Since then, Pamuk has moved in new directions, including curation, photography, and painting. Um, he devoted himself to painting until the age of 22, a practice, he has been a practice he has refocused on in recent years. And tomorrow's afternoon event at the Nasher Museum will address this aspect of his work. His work reflects the idea of the novelist as archivist and curator, perhaps best exemplified in the cluster of works he produced around the Museum of Innocence, beginning with a novel in 2009, then an actual brick and mortar museum in 2012, as well as a museum catalog and later a documentary film in 2015. Together, the multifaceted project reflects Pamuk's radical intertextuality. His latest novel, Nights of Plague, is an outbreak narrative set during a plague contagion in the late Ottoman era. The third major plague pandemic has killed millions <clears throat> as it spread over the world and arrives in 1901 to Mingaria, a half Muslim and a half Christian island in the Ottoman Mediterranean. The Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, sent his mo sends his most accomplished quarantine expert to the island, an Orthodox Christian. Some of the Muslims, including followers of a religious sect and its leader, Sheikh Hamdullah, refuse to respect the quarantine. Pandemics have a special place in Pamuk's work. In his second novel, The Silent House, the main character, a historian, chases after what he calls a, quote, plague state. This is a situation created while plague ravages the Ottoman Empire and the government goes into remote quarantine. Contagion reappears in his third novel, The White Castle, set in 17th century Istanbul. This time, a Venetian captured by the Ottomans is frightened by a plague epidemic, which has also become a metaphor for conversion. His Ottoman Muslim master is a fatalist who doesn't fear death. Together, master and slave are able to predict the end of the plague by tracking the number of deaths in each neighborhood. Method confronts, um, method confronts fatalist resignation in this novel through what might be called a rudimentary form of contact tracing. The idea of the plague state and the conflict between method and mysticism are subtextual details of two novels that first appeared in Turkish in the mid-1980s. 
Pomuk has nurtured an interest in the nexus of plagues, quarantines, religion, and state formation for 40 years. In Nights of Plague, this has resulted in a full-blown account of a plague state that explores the, <coughs> the question of whether an epidemic can be the catalyst for a new political formation. Knights of Plague situates us at the intersection of ep ep epidemiology and nation-state formation. As such, this is a novel that dramatizes a variety of bi biopolitics, of what we could call biopolitics. In her book, Contagious, Cultures, Carriers, and the Outbreak Narrative, Duke scholar Priscilla Wald reminds us that if we can speak of the nation as an imagined community, in Benedict Anderson's formulation, we can also consider the nation's quote unquote imagined immunities. She writes, quote, while emerging infections are inextricable from global interdependence in all versions of these outbreak accounts, however, the threat they pose requires a national response. The, commu the community to be protected, protected is thereby configured in cultural and political as well as biological terms. The nation as immunological ecosystem, end quote. Of course, the plague in a novel isn't just the plague. It's a, for Pomuk, it's a recurring force of transformation. The contagion may turn you into someone else, may change you forever. This is what the COVID-19 epidemic has done to us, has it not? So we understand that Pomuk's fiction, ostensibly historical, is also intertemporal, sustaining more than one historical period at the same time, including our present. For tonight's event, we'll uh, invite the, the author to read a short passage, followed by a conversation between us, and concluding with a question and answer session. Please welcome Orhan Pomuk. Hello, very p pleased to be here. The, I'm gonna read Just a Spoonful from the Ocean, Erda already told you about the social context, the historical context. I'm going to just to give you a feeling of there's also a psychological, a metaphysical um, context in an epidemic situation, as we all know. So we are in no, one no. third of the novel, the epidemic, bubonic plague epidemic is obviously there, it's felt. Maybe I'll just give you a bit introduction about the third plague, bubonic plague pandemic. It started in 1894 in China and, and stayed in Asia and China. And in 25 years, it killed 20 million people while Almost no one was killed in West, in the United States and Europe. This is the, one of the reasons that I, when I learned about this, no, I am known as an East-West, as a sort of a self-imposed agenda in my especially early novel, so I thought this is interesting. But this is not the only reason that I wrote this novel. You don't write a 650-page novel for, with one reason, with one motivation. This idea motivated me to set a novel during the third plague pandemic, which started in 1894 and reached the peripheries of West Europe, um, whatever. This plague, like in my novel, really came to Smyrna, Istanbul, uh, but it was stopped by the successful operations of the uh, Autobot Quarantine Organization. At that time, what we today call World Health Organization used to be called World Quarantine Organization. And they were getting orders from Europe and getting telegraphs every day, do this, do that, do this, do that, and they were doing, and that's how they stopped. But that doesn't happen in my novel. In a way, my novel has, has, a, has an what if, what if they can stop it, events change. This novel is what if they can stop it. Uh, and since Ottoman Empire is the boundary between, a sort of a boundary between East and West, and by the way, uh, for a while, is the boundary between East and West. Ottoman Empire boundary was the river Danube. 
And in all, if you read auto, uh, European histories, European memoirs, you see the lands been, uh, east of Danube were the lands of plague, because that is the border. The plague was in the Ottoman side. So we are in one third of the novel. What I'm going to read as Dr. Nuri is the main male protagonist of the novel. Dr. Nuri woke up before dawn. As he got dressed, he watched his sweetly sleeping wife and at the same time kept thinking that the rumors must be true, that the governor Pasha must be planning to do what the governors usually did in emergencies and execute Ramiz and his two henchmen. Uh, don't worry, Ramiz is a bad guy. Uh, and, and execute Ramiz and his henchmen without waiting for approval from the high court in Istanbul. He walked down the stairs, followed by the respectful glances of the guards on night shift and made instinctively for the inner courtyard. Most executions were carried out in the inner courtyards of government buildings, but there was nobody there. The overgrown sheepdog that was always tethered to the railings on the kitchen windows and barked relentlessly every night had vanished at the start of the plague outbreak. In the darkness, there was not even a single shadow to be seen. He walked past the columns, he, Dr. Nuri, our protagonist, he walked past the columns of the dome gallery and felt like a ghost. As he slowly circled the square, he kept thinking that any moment now, he would run into someone, but the night was like a dark, two-dimensional room. No matter how many steps he took, he could not find his way out of that black box. But sometimes the shadow of a tree or a faded color would drift silently past him. He passed the quarantine notices and the shuttered shops, then turned into an alleyway and walked in the dark for a long time across the never-ending streets of the plague-ridden city. It continues like that, 650 pages. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, reading, Orhan. I, I thought I, I, we'd begin with uh, that character, Mina Ming Mingar. And um, I had a question a little bit about in the first page of the novel. Uh, it begins with her statement about the historical novel and history written in the form of a novel. So how does history and the novel inter intersect here? I wanted you to maybe say a few words about that. Okay, uh, so I decided, I think uh, uh, so many questions for me, you know, all, all, although rightfully you ask one question. Um, his, um, how much a historical novel is history, how much of it is literature. Of course, it's obvious, 99% of historical novel is literature. But then, well, actually, we also read historical novels to enjoy history too. Uh, what is the best example? It's war and peace. And what do we see there? Napoleon and Tolstoy reads, read hundreds of volumes of Napoleon or generals with Kutuzov and all the military history. Then he, believe me, he's Tolstoy, he's a hard worker and a very talented writer. He got all the details right, but then we don't read a historical novel to get all the details right. We want to go into this world through the eyes of an imaginary person that not only he rewrites Napoleon, but Tolstoy also invents imaginary char characters. Pierre, who wants to kill N uh, Napoleon. So we, when we buy a, um, history, uh, decide to read a historical novel, we also want to revisit history, a, a history that should be rendered. We will come to that sometimes, now it's not realistic. That should be rendered realistically B, an imaginary character that we would identify with so that we would go a sort of a H.G. Wells time tra uh, travel, go back and enjoy those times. The classical historical novel is invented in this way. 
And of course, once he was writing a classical historical novel, Tolstoy asked himself, well, why are these imp events important? And, in, and wrote 2,000 pages in four years, War and Peace, and he also wrote an epilogue, um, and, and I'm sorry, I aft an afterword to his novel, which is almost an essay in the role of the individual in human history. Now that he is writing a history based on human character, he was, it was impossible to avoid this, but he, in a way, in his last 50 pages, damaged the effect of his novel because he wrote an essay. But in a way, my novel, this novel, talks with Tolstoy. It has the ambition of being a Tolstoyan big panoramic picture of decay, decaying and disintegrating years of Ottoman Empire on the one hand, and also um, one is a, attempts to be a realistic novel of character, plot, and this or that. So um, let's talk a little bit about the era in which it's set, in the Hamidian era, uh, when Sultan Abdul Hamid II is, um, is ruling, and there's a, he's an interesting historical figure because uh, sort of a contested figure in many ways, depending on which way um, or which political perspective he's seen. So I wanted you to maybe talk a little bit about the, um, the place of that era, which was a 30-year era, and the fact that the novel is set in that era. Okay, maybe we should give information to um, 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 readers, people who are here who do not know anything about Abdul Hamid. Abdul Hamid II is a sort of a Tur Turkish Queen Victoria, not politically, but, uh, 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 but uh, as a modernizer, as a person who stayed in power for many years, 34 years, as a person who implemented many, many modernistic system, uh, modernistic, modern institutions, hospitals, factories, army, um, educational reforms. He was also interested very much in schools, hospitals and schools. He was, he was dying to make open medical schools. They first started in French, so forth and so on. One part of his mind was very busy importing um, Western, modern Western institutions. Uh, another part of him was also very busy uh, destroying what is little, very little of Ottoman democracy where there was a parliament. And the first thing he did was to close the parliament and run the country all by himself. And, and one of the, the main characters, uh, Pakize, is related to her, it happens to be her uh, niece. And so he, he, he casts a shadow in, in many ways th throughout the novel. There's some in interesting details. For example, his interest in literature and in particular the, the work of Sherlock Holmes. Sorry? The work of Sherlock Holmes. Oh, okay. Um, uh, um, you know, maybe I should tell about. Uh, I behaved, I wrote about Abdul Hamid. Uh, in fact, in the novel, I also wrote that Abdul Hamid, in a way, invented political Islam. Why? As um, he was raised in the Ottoman palace, um, he was, he knew, he, he played a bit piano. He was, uh, knew a bit French. He enjoyed opera. He enjoyed detective novels. And by taste and culture and education, he was not a typical, what we today would call political Islamist. But his empire was being taken away from him uh, that, uh, that all the nationalities of Ottoman Empire from Greeks to Bulgarians, from, uh, uh, from Serbians to Arabs were uprising or were, uh, um, uh, were in more friendly with British, Europeans, others. And he wanted to, Abdul Hamid II wanted to say to his European enemies, essentially to the British, if you take away more of my empire, I'm going to make these Muslims uprise in what we today call Pakistan, India, Indonesia against you because it's a way of his fighting back. Okay. Good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now that you said this, yeah. now I'll turn back to Abdul Hamid. This is a fact. There are so many books about this. Abdul Hamid was addicted to detective stories. This is also, was in, uh, there is our PhDs, books about this. 
he was running the whole Ottoman Empire, um, which at that time was a whole Middle, Middle East and some parts of the Balkans, uh, but a, a very busy man. But at night, he, he was, in order to be able to sleep, just like a child listening to fairy tales, was listening to translated the newest detective stories that were published in essentially in French, then later in English. His translation uh, uh, committee in the, uh, um, in the royal palace was also doing these things. Uh, it is, of course, very interesting that an Ottoman ruler listening and reading uh, um, detective stories, which was a new genre, but he was so busy with this, and he, he loved Canon Doyle's in newest inven new invention, Sherlock Holmes. So he sent him, he asked him to come to Turkey, gave him a medal. Canon Doyle was also newly married, gave another medal to his new wife, so forth and so on. That's a fasc fascinating uh, history. So you, you began writing five years ago. Um, what were your thoughts when the novel coincided with the COVID? Uh, pandemic. You can take a, talk a little bit about the way. Yeah, you also talk about that. I was thinking about writing a, a n novel set in medieval Ottoman times. There are in my early novel in 1983, Silent House. There it is an Ottoman historian looking, searching for and traces of Ottoman uh, play. Or in my White Castle, which just as you have pointed out, there are chapters or uh, almost epidemiology. Uh, chapters in which two scientists are looking at numbers and trying to stop plague. Uh, so I was busy with the subject of epidemic more with plague, but I uh, didn't write this novel for 40 years. At the beginning, I was, my mind was busy writing about fatalism or Western Orientalist uh, idea uh, that Muslims, Turks, Ottomans were, are fatalistic. They don't take that very, they don't run away from plague. They don't take measures. They don't know. Have, they don't have a sense of quarantine, which is partly true. The Turkish first Turkish Ottoman quarantine was made in early 19th century, while it's an uh, Italian word for 40 days for, for how many years? 400 years. So it was a bit late, and, it, and in, in fact, I later begin to think maybe these Western observers were right. They're partly uh, uh, Ottomans, Turks were fatalistic. So it was I was not strong enough with my conviction that this is a uh, Orientalist slander. Uh, so I delayed and delayed. While I was continuously, as I decided to write a novel about a subject, I pile up books. I have shelves of shelves of plague, plague and Islam, plague and this, plague and that. Finally, I come across the third plague pandemic, and at the same time, this was 19th century. Actually, in 19th century, the dominant uh, epidemic is uh, cholera. And in Russia, in Poland, there were anti-quarantine uprisings in Russia, Poland, and also in Renaissance Florence, there were also quarantine uprisings. And I, and, and, and it was inevitable that once there is a pandemic, that there, the governments do many things simultaneously. Maybe I'll tell you just very uh, fast that well, you're asking me, what did you feel? Well, I felt that people would think that this has also happened when I was finishing snow. People think that 9-11 happened right after or right before that I was going to publish snow in Turkey, so I deleted Osama bin Laden a chapter. So here, again, this, uh, um, I was writing my novel for three and a half years, and suddenly there's a coronavirus pandemic started. So what do I do? So I immediately decided this time I will write an article, say to, hey, I was writing this novel. Hey. <laughs> uh, and I wrote that article, published it in New York Times. It's for one full page and published all over the world to say, uh, and in that article, maybe I sum up uh, because I, it, I also felt a responsibility reading about plague and pandemic and quarantine and humanity for so many years. I, I know so much, and humanity is just aware of that. And I said, more or less, humanity, human beings, did the same hundreds of thousands of years. First, they deny it's not only bad politicians or Trumps or Bolsonaros. Everyone denies. Whether it's a, even the very good, well-meaning politicians deny. Then the numbers go up. 
then there is an immense tsunami of gossip, conspiracy, Jews bought it, Muslims bought it, the people from the next um, village bought it, this bought it, the governor bought it, this, and then the numbers again go up, then the, uh, again the reaction, then sometimes this, um, government clerks don't come to office, sometimes governments collapse, sometimes governments in medieval times run away from the city, or most of the time when there are plague epidemics, and epidemics always, almost of, most of the time happen in summers, the Ottoman government is busy conquering some place, place in Europe. When the, they decide there's again plague in Istanbul, they don't return back. They stay in Adrianopolis, Edirne, and wait for the plague to end. In the end, Edirne, Adrianopolis was the second or third capital of Ottoman Empire for this reason. So why do you, how did we come to this? No, no, fa fascin it's fascinating. <laughs> it's a fascinating answer there. So um, let, me, let me just take a step back. So the figure of the historian, the figure of the, the writer or the novelist actually loom large in, in your work, in a lot of, in a lot of your novels. So, um, and, and what you just described, the way you were mulling this over yes. for 40 years. And, then, you know, and you do a level of research for fiction that would be, one would consider uh, uh, you know, archival or, or historical. So what kind of research no. were you doing? No, okay, I understand. Yeah. I never do archival research. It is uh, archival, you have to be very fluent in Ottoman old script and read like this. And I am not proud of doing this kind of research then. I am doing what my brother do. My brother is an uh, economical historian. He goes to archives and reads things. I don't. I read that what uh, people like him go to archives and write books and PhDs. I read those books or memoirs of old Pashas. Or, in fact, maybe I'll tell you more interesting things that partly this book is about, is based on the reports written by British doctors from Bombay and Shanghai to London, where these doctors, I really respect them, were going out to fields. And they were, especially in India, hated by locals just because they were British and colonial and bad people. Communication was zero. They were afraid of them because they thought these bad guys are picking them up and taking to some place and killing them. Actually, they were taking them to a hospital if it's possible to uh, cure them. Um, but on the other hand, I learned in, say, in Bombay, they were doing gas or lisol very, what we would do today. In the villages around Bombay, they were burning the villages. They, were, they didn't have the power to impose, talk, negotiate with the villagers. One source was this, this problematic of education, uh, communication between locals. Ottoman Empire was not a British colony. Ottoman Empire was an it was a colonizing empire, not a colonized empire. So Abdul Hamid's problem was a bit different, but then some shadows of colonial problems of education, communication, transparency was not lacking, was lacking. 5% of Ottoman Empire or all the world was a new only read and write. How do you explain to this? This is a microbe. This is what, is what you have to do. This is a quarantine. There was nothing like that. So, and, and also, uh, Ottoman Empire, 50% were Muslim, and 90% of the doctors were Orthodox because they were more educated. Abdul Hamid could not open uh, medical schools in uh, um, Turkish, they, and they spoke French, so forth and so on. So it was a complex situation. So let's, um, the other part of the story as a subtext is, is the, the rise of the independence of this island, right? So, and, I, and I'm wondering if we could talk about one of the characters uh, who are instrumental there, maybe, maybe uh, Major Kiamil, who starts out as a bodyguard but then becomes the first president. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about his character in light of this, which is a slightly ironic development of national self-determination that emerges in the context of not only the end of the empire but the, the, the plague itself. Okay. Yes, um, I, uh, uh, my novel, Knights of Play, is more or less a realistic um, uh, um, fresco, panorama of Ottoman Empire. And it was lo lovingly paid, I paid loving attention to the details, as you said, a lot of 
historical research. But if you go to Tolstoy, your novel is so good, Mr. Tolstoy. You read so much about Napoleon, he would hate you, you know. <laughs> he, uh, uh, he, <laughs> he would, it's not his research that he wants. It's this artistic, uh, literary uh, qualities. Yes, I did all of my homework, but the value of my book does not depend on that. Maybe in this novel I did a lot of homework and maybe proud of it and maybe I am opening this subject of what is history, what is personal, uh, personality, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a kind of important coup scene uh, that happens when sort of independence is declared? Yes. And, and it, it evoked a little bit of, of, of some of um, what you'd written about in Snow as well. And there were parts of the novel um, when I was reading along that really evoked your, some of your earlier work. So, so okay, there are so many things in your question. First, okay. maybe. Uh, uh, there is subject of isolation. Once, as I said, I was aware of the Pol uh, uprisings in Poland and Russia. I, just, I immediately saw that my novel would be political. It would be a political allegory about uh, um, um, authoritarianism, repression, um, um, human feelings in that. And the second, I also saw, since this was a sort of a... Um, realistic description of disintegration of Ottoman Empire. But my aim was also to write an allegory about the rise of nations, preferably small nations, out of the ashes of an empire, their, in, uh, uh, their invention of a language, their religion, their uniqueness, their difference from the others. If you are a student at Columbia University in the first class of sociology, what is a nation? Then they will say a nation is based on A, religion, B, history, D, shared history, shared trauma, geography, and they will also say language, and perhaps in this novel, language is stressed, but geography, island, makes it clear that these people share the same history and geography. Uh, I also needed an island in this novel, and I immediately realized that just like my political novel, Snow, I need isolation in snow. My uh, in, in novel uh, that takes place in small northern eastern town of Kars, it snows so much that the island, that small town is isolated from the rest of Turkey. Here, it, there is... Um, bubonic pandemic and the island is put un, uh, under blockage or um, because uh, there's quarantine and people cannot leave. But once a place is isolated from rest of humanity, this is a literary convention that events go, the dramatic drama intensifies. The, what is invisible is gets visible because things happen quicker upper class mobility in small isolated places are uh, faster and quicker and more visible. That's why I wanted, I needed a small island. But when I wrote uh, Snow, everyone criticized, well, this didn't happen in our town, this didn't happen in our little beautiful town of cars. <laughs> I did not want that anymore. I did not want to write an accurate description of a history of a Greek Ottoman island. I wanted to invent my island so that my message would pass effortlessly. Also, so I decided to invent this island, which is based on um, details of a Greek Republic island of Crete, partly a small island of Castellarizo, which is right across this uh, Turkish city of Kars. And for the last 70 years, every summer, I'm going to uh, the island of Prinkipo, Bukada in Istanbul. The horse-drawn carriages were still busy, in, uh, still in business, uh, only till two years ago. So I copied a lot of island details with some sort of a, a nostalgia, but nostalgia means you want to go back and return in old good times. I am a person who is writing about the decay of an Ottoman Empire with loving attention to its strangeness, beauty, but I'm not nostalgic about the past. I, the fact that you will write lovingly about one subject doesn't mean that you want to go back to that period. I'm telling you this because I, it always reminds me when people say, oh, you like so lovingly about Ottoman Empire. Yes, but do I want to return to it? 
you know, they, um, Japanese writer um, Tanizaki wrote a book called In Praise of Shadows, which is a short pamphlet, 60, 80 pages, about the beauties of Japanese old wooden house. And they said, oh, Mr. Tanizaki, you would love to really live there, right? And he said, no, I, I <laughs> want electricity, I want water, I want this, I want all the modern. Just because I love it, does that mean that I want to leave it there? So I say this uh, because when they say you write so lovingly about Ottoman Empire, so you may be someone like Tayyip Erdogan who is putting on Ottomanists. No, I, uh, I don't like their stress on the Ottomans' victory over Europeans, their Ottoman fights. They love the Ottomans who were conquering Europe and getting places and killing people. I like Ottomans where, unfortunately, they were sadly in decline. So, so just a, a step back to the, a, a step back to the um, uh, to, to the issue of uh, and you talked about the island as a as a sort of literary trope, uh, but but what about uh, works about the plague that that may have influenced oh, you? Okay. So, so and, and I mean yeah, if, if you comment on that. Uh, okay, then. you know we writers when we finish our uh, novels, we, we fantasize one day my novel will be published and I will do interviews, right? Yeah. You, uh, 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 and, uh, email, or you, uh, you write what, what is called uh, uh, maybe paratext, uh, yeah, that, uh, paratext. Uh, uh, things that are around the subject, the back cover, the title. The, uh, 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 another thing that uh, the writers always dream up those things, uh, Marcel Proust, uh, um, uh, they were not publishing his seven volume novel, uh, did covers of his books that they were refusing to publish. So I was also <laughs> fantasizing, making interviews. My novel is published. The journalists are asking. This was it's normal that I've been doing this for 45 years, so that, that will happen again. So I was thinking that the best three books ever written about bubonic plague are by their qualities in this order. Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year is a great, great, great novel. Um, Alexander Manzoni, mid-19th century, Italian War and Peace, The Bidroff, which is a penguin classic, and Albert Camus, famous novel, everyone is asking me about that, they all know about that, is Plague. And these are the best books ever written about plague, and they were written by writers who never experienced plague, nor even a pandemic, and I was thinking that, wow, I will say this, and that I am the fourth one. I also did never experience any pandemic meaning. I am also a modest writer writing a plague book, reading books, but that didn't happen somehow. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I wanted to ask a follow-up question. Um, All questions are follow-ups, I agree, I think. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to talk about the way that the, the character, as uh, uh, Mina again, who, who's assemb really assembling this history novel, so it seems to change you know, to, to, in the second half of the novel a bit, and, and kind of her, um, she becomes a little more of a nationalist in a sense, but the, the transformation of her character is really interesting. Yeah, but so it's so hard to pin down, yes, thank you for asking this smart question. That, uh, first of all, uh, people, when they ask this question, also ask why, why a fem female narrator, or why a female letter writer? Well, it, I'll give you a very simple answer. When my almost 35, 40 years ago, my first novels were published in Turkey, I would come across um, my readers, uh, female readers, who would say, Mr. Pamuk, we like your novels very much. I like this one, I like that one. But we don't see enough women in your novels, and I would feel very embarrassed and shy, <laughs> and she'll say, maybe she is right. And till then, I made it a set, but in the end, art of the novel is based on our capacity to identify with people who are not, not like us, by gender, by class, by history, a geography, a culture, a this or that, there is a limit to be able to identify with someone who's not like you. In early youth, it's harder. And now, starting from my name is Red, I made it my business to render my female characters more fully. Henry James has an expression. 
he wrote a letter to a friend saying, I am going to write this story, but I'm trying to decide from whose eyes I should see this story. So I decided I'll, do, um, I'll make my female characters see the story as much as possible because it was a self-imposed reforming program, and I did it. And partly uh, those characters, I need a historian because I already knew from the beginning that my novel would cover almost 100 years, that my novel is, in the end, is about the uh, decline of an empire and uh, the, in, uh, the invention of a new nation from its ashes, how they, uh, uh, how they do this. So uh, uh, at once an empire is dead, the emperor is also disappears. But we do not know it clearly now. But in old times, the emperor may, meant he, he is a sort of a shadow of God. He has worldly qualities in, in the... Uh, in the times of old empires, people used to go to war to die for their uh, Kaiser, to die for their king, to die for, to die for their Padishah, Shah, Sultan, whatever. But when empire goes away and the, when the kingdom goes away, then there is no one to die for. You have to now invent secular, nationalistic, sacreds. The emergence and invention of small, big nations is, that means there is also emergence and invention of secul secular sacreds. Now people are going to war and killing each other mm. for their nation, for their blood, for their history, for their borders, but no one uh, kills another person for the prime minister as much as I know. Maybe there are also people who are killing others for the prime minister. So, but once an empire, uh, so, but then you have to motivate people. This is your Germanness, Turkishness, Mingarianness. Mm. You have to die. it. You, you have it in your language, your ancestors, your blood, so forth and so on. And this is, in order to motivate and educate people, you have to invent secular mythologies. But it takes 650 pages of, in, to show that these secular inventions, how much are they are based on little humane details of real life, that in, the, in fact what my novel is in the long range doing is showing petty details of normal life than some... Um, 80 years and 500 pages, these uh, little details of life are converted into scenes that you would see on the banknotes or national posters or in statues, this or that. My novel, Knights of Play, does many things perhaps, is also doing, giving us a, this idea of invention of the ideology, the mythology, the legends of a secular nation. Uh, once you're secular and a nation, then you have to have uh, also, again, sacred things that you don't want to argue about. Uh, so so uh, I just want to say that we'll be taking some questions in a few minutes. I'll ask one more question, and I, and I think I'm just going to read from the, uh, the, the epilogue here, if you, and you could talk a little, maybe a little bit about how this Tolstoy quote actually uh, is reflected in the, the novel itself. Uh, at the approach of danger, there are always two. Maybe points. okay, okay now, okay, please, uh, yes, uh, uh, slowly, yes. Oh, okay, so okay. Uh, he is reading from Tolstoy. It's my epigraph. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, at the approach of danger, there are always two voices that speak with equal power in the human soul. One very reasonably tells a man to consider the nature of the danger and the means of escaping it. The other still more reasonably, says that it is too depressing and painful to think of the danger, since it is not in man's power to foresee everything and avert the general course of events. And it is therefore better to disregard what is painful till it comes and to think about what is pleasant. Okay, this is from War and Peace, and it is so clear in the novel that the horrible danger coming from West is not plague, but Napoleon. The 
Moscovites do not know that, that they are incapable of stopping Napoleon, and in fact, he invades, he comes. Um, um, but I, when I was reading that, and I was reading Tolstoy as I was writing my novel, wow, well, oh, it, it also, that was how around 2020, April, May, humanity was responding because it, there was a no vaccination, a no remedy. It looked like a strange, I for a while thought that this was such a scary thing, I'd rather finish my novel quick and we're gonna all die. That's what I was thinking. In fact, maybe one thing that you didn't ask, but I want to tell, mm -hmm. is that I did all this research, I read all these doctor's reports and all Ottoman Pasha's uh, memoirs and this or that, I did um, uh, not as much as Tolstoy, but I also did my own work. But when the real epidemic started and overtook us, and I said, my God, my characters are not afraid of me, while the coronavirus kills and at its worst time, I think, one in 100, while bubonic plague kills one in three, and once you get it, there is no way out, you're dead. Mm -hmm. It's so scary, while people, I think, relatively speaking, were afraid of it less, while perhaps, perhaps, because they did not have a TV, they knew that there were some rumors, some people were dying, only if their friends, their family died, they were afraid. They would not be seeing a, a, a horrible scenes as we were seeing on TV. People and tubed. People are being burned in India. People are being carried in trucks in Italy. So, what one thing I learned from life uh, that, that that you are really scared in an epidemic, which was not in my characters. Didn't were not scared that much, so I injected my fear to them. Thank you. Um, so we do have time for questions, and I think there's a mic there, if you would uh, be so kind as to, to stand and ask your question into the mic. Sometimes, in order to motivate people, I say, if you're afraid of asking the first question, ask the second one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My question is that as a historian, and I always envious because some of the things can be described by novelists better than we can, uh, that the, the plague as a term has really big geopolitical meaning in the 19th century. And uh, you have always dealt with this question of East and West. And there's this term of uh, plague of colonialism and, of course, the yellow plague or plague of Islam. Um, so were these in your mind also thinking beyond no. the island? No, in fact, uh, in fact, it's quoted in the novel that uh, Dostoevsky's crime and uh, uh, punishment, Raskolnikov is our great hero, and, uh, and towards the end of it, Raskolnikov says, one day there will be a plague coming from Asia uh, that will swept over all Europe. Raskolnikov said this in mid-19, toward, uh, in the 1960s, uh, um, but it's not clear whether the word plague is used as a metaphor or realistically. If you go to Google and write plague, then you would find a, a million metaphors, not real plague, not bubonic plague or anything. It is now used as more, the word is now being used more as a metaphor for something else. Um, um, but I'm not interested in that. When, I, when you see the plague, it's a, the medical sickness in my novel. It's not about, it's not a metaphor. Thank you. So you are interested in the past. I mean, this is not the first time in most of your novels, right? Um, and you know, my name is Red, and um, even Museum of Innocence. Um, so, how has it started for you to be interested in the past, and how um, does it inform today? Like, what do we know about I, today? And it, then I'm going to just follow up. Like this book is talking about the plague. How does it, you know, explain, for instance, you know, the reactions to COVID-19, for instance, you know, what happened in Turkey. Do you think there's like, you know, um, 
you know, the cultural explanation of, you know, how people react to epidemics and pandemics that, you know, your, your novel maybe kind of like gives a perspective of that. Do yes, you think, you know, uh, yeah, like okay, that? two things. Yeah. Um, uh, um, yeah, there are many reasons to write historical novels, but, am I, um, but, but I'm not motivated to write a historical novel to take lessons from past. For example, my White Castle is a historical novel, but I was interested in history, not for its educational or uh, informative value, but for its imagery, uh, because it, uh, history feeds my romantic imagination, if it's the right term for my mind. Uh, so I love history, but because of its imagery or its atmosphere, ambiance, whatever word you use it, but not to explain and show to humanity, uh -huh, this has happened in history, so you'd better not do that. It's, uh, this is not about it. But of course, once you begin writing a novel, uh, three and a half, four years before pandemic, and it starts, everyone is looking at you, so what is the lesson? Give us the lesson. Yeah. <laughs> it's inevitable, and I was also a bit uneasy about that. Uh, also, it's a boring subject, like uh, Second World War is finished, I'm just, oh, here is my First World War novel. Who would read that, I thought, for a while? But uh, anyway, but I make it sure that I'm not talking, I'm not writing a novel which can be read um, uh, allegorically that directly. Okay, maybe, maybe, if people don't want to ask questions, they are right, maybe. Or do you have a question? One last question, maybe, from you. Uh, okay, yeah, please, please. If, you, if you don't mind. So first and foremost, thank you so much for the lovely talk. Um, you mentioned the notion of uh, the character's eyes as being a means of the storytelling and constructing the story. Character's line. eyes? Yeah. Uh, earlier in the talk, and um, so I was wondering how do you place yourself as the author um, into these different personas and different, you know, shoes in order to construct this idea of like a shared human experience that can go past boundaries of gender and class and race and those mark markers. So, uh, you're asking how do I do it? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you know, how it's, you're asking maybe, if the creative writing question, how do you invent a character or how do you identify with a character, more or less, you're asking. Well, I think the art of the novel is based on a very unique human strength that we human beings have the power to identify uh, with others who are not like us or uh, to feel uh, the pain of others and see that and try to see it, other people's positions and try to see it in our mind's eye. We sometimes call this compassion, that we not only look at a person, oh, I can kill this and eat him. No, we also say, oh, this person can be killed and eaten. Oh, I'm sorry for this and try to see the world through that person's eyes. In fact, now that you said I, the joy of reading and writing novels is also about the joy of seeing our common world through other, pe other people's eyes. To, we read the novel to understand our other people are as jealous or sad or frustrated or uh, rep uh, repressed or, or melancholic or depressed as I am. What do they, when they go out in the streets, do they see the same things? These are also the reasons why we write novels. And then it's a joy to be able to invent another person who is not, who doesn't have the habits, culture, gender, whatever, of the writer, and try to see the world through that person's point of view. In fact, well, uh, I argue that political no a political novel is should, should not be a political novel should not be a political novel because the writer is talking about um, um, party cards of his characters and one of them is voting for a party A and the other one is voting for party B and their 
parties are described in the novel and that's a political novel. Yes, that a political novel can be a political novel like that. But more importantly, a novel can be political because the writer is doing a lot of effort to identify with other people. Uh, that is, uh, people who are essentially different, again, by gender, by class, more important, uh, by geography, by being minority, by religion, different. Isn't this the most political subject? That, yes. So, in a way, if you write a good novel, you transcend the one of the most important political questions or make them visible. The mechanisms of art of the novel is such that you don't have to spend a lot of time, how do I do politics? Writing a good novel is politics. You write to see the world from the point of view of a lower class, black woman, person, character, then it's in, by definition that you suddenly do a lot of energy rendering the total picture right and, and situate that person in the right place. So, yes. Yes? Suddenly, a question, to ask a question is a popular gesture now. People, people are listening up, yeah. So, in Usually the reading of Global South novels in general, there's this tendency of reading protagonists as like embodiments of national culture sometimes. So like for example, in Museum of Innocence, Kemal and Fusun might be read as a version or an embodiment of a certain, you know, element of Turkish culture. So like, I think what my question is in your work, we usually see like a Joycean understanding where the city itself serves as a character and their protagonists who also in some light represent national cultures or like, you know, spatial identities or like imagined communities maybe. So how do you reconcile like, you know, the possibilities of like, you know, two presences representing a similar identity in your work, like the embodiment of Istanbul. You say, are you saying similar identity? Yeah, but uh, could, could, could you isolate the question? For so, uh, sorry, yeah. so my question yeah. is, in your work, we feature like a vivid description of Istanbul to the point where it becomes a character of its own. How do you... Like, you description know, of Istanbul, yes. Which becomes a character of its own. So how do you reconcile the identities of your characters when you have like your setting serving as a character too? So how do I reconcile my identities and, uh, the, the, and setting? the setting? Yes. Yeah, of course, the character is not too far away from uh, the geography, history. The character carries geography, history, culture. When we, when we say, after reading Anna Karenina, when I say to another person, Anna Karenina, the reader does not only remember uh, this female imaginary character, remembers all Russia because she is in touch with all Russia. Inventing a character is also uh, uh, putting he or she in touch with many, many things about urban life, daily life in modern times. We invent a character so that he or she will touch many, many things. We invent characters because we also want to show problems, surface of life, uh, important points. We invent characters so that they engage with the drama, with the, uh, with the background, with the geography, with Istanbul. Yes. Okay, maybe one last question. You. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna sneak in a question here if I could. Thank you so no. much for your talk. Um, as someone who's just come, had the pleasure of coming, visiting the Museum of Innocence, I was thinking during your talk about the tremendous work that you, the, the joyful work that you give the viewer to the museum, right? You are confronted with an abundance of objects um, and, and, um, and histories, micro histories. And I was, that got me thinking about the role of your, of your reader, of your audiences. And I wonder if you might connect, just say a little bit about, about who you write for and perhaps also what you learned about your, about your communities of readers and your audiences through the, um, the experience of the museum. Okay, um, as far as my, um, my experience of myself and other writers I have known, writers rarely say to themselves, who do I write for? 
Actually, the writers I know, and are also talking about myself, we first ask this. I want to be a writer. What do I write? Who do I write for? But you first write because there's a desire to write, just like an artist, painter wants to paint or invent something, be creative. You don't think, who do I want for? Then you begin to think, who do I write for? So that they will buy my books, buy my paintings, so that I can continue and be motivated to do so. In the end, um, I don't say, I never said, I write for 18 year old, I write for Turks, I write for this, uh, for this people, for that people, for my international audience. Most of the time, the truth is, I write for all of them, but it depends. Sometimes you write for your wife, sometimes you write for the general, imaginary, utopian readership, which will you naively think will read you. Sometimes you write for the Turkish readership. Sometimes you write for the, all these people who had read me in 62 languages. So you motivate yourself. You also, my experience of writers, their biographies, myself, writer friends, writers, um, in order to motivate themselves, continuously change their target audience. Why? Because actually his wife would not like that, or perhaps Turks would not like that, or perhaps uh, others would not like that. So you continuously motivate yourself, changing your targeted readership. Uh, most of the time, the desire to write, the, the desire to be an artist, the desire to invent, the desire to be alone in a room, is enough. Then you begin to think, who's going to read this? Who's going to see this? Who's? Then you begin to think about that. But I am not a writer who thinks I will represent this group, so I have to write about that. In fact, that uh, art, a political novel is not about representing um, your group. It is representing human beings. They may be from different groups, different things. In the end, I naively believe in the idea of general uh, uh, readership, but of course, practically speaking, I'm writing for the, uh, I, if you force me, I am writing for people who read novels in translation. I am writing for people who had read my previous novel uh, um, or who would be reading novels in China, in Korea, in Latin America, and wherever, uh, uh, novels like this in the end. Those people are experienced and informed. They can understand my novel. That I, I, it's not that I know about horrible problems. I have to express that I wrote a novel and everyone will understand. Everyone will understand a journalistic article about these horrible things better and quickly than reading a novel about that. I think we have one more. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, just a little bit of, I guess, context. Um, I took Professor Goknar's class last year on Ottoman history and Turkish history. And one of our assigned re readings was The White Castle. And so I guess I'll probably talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was nice. Like it's at the end, it was like confusing. I had to read that <laughs> again and again. That was one of like, we spent a whole day on like what that he meant. Uh, but like one of like the main themes that we discussed in that class was this idea of knowledge as power, and I, I guess it was this discourse on the Turkish identity in East and West. And my question kind of is, does your book, I obviously haven't read it. White Castle, you mean? Uh, no, I guess this one. Uh, does, does this also deal with the idea of knowledge as power, especially in terms of when you talk about no. the plague or East and West or as I said, there is some East and West, um, and 25 million people dying of bubonic plague and no one dying in Europe. Maybe there is that kind of thing. Again, if you look for similarities, there is an idea of that you can stop plague by not going from home to home as a doctor, but making a map of the spread of the um, uh, microbe, uh, plague microbe, and decide why it's spreading in these neighborhoods. In fact, there is a parallel and intended allusion between Abdul Hamid's love of Sherlock Holmes, a person who never go to field but just gets information from his Watson, 
and reads them in his table, just like Abdul Hamid reading re reports about Ottoman Empire, but never leaving his office or his palace. But then he is, Sherlock Holmes is so smart that he suddenly deduces the result and stops it. And if and, uh, this novel has also a White Castle uh, um, information, has uh, suggests power kind of quality, because my, some of my doctors are aware of what is an invented British new science called epidemiology. You don't have to go from sick person to another sick person. You have to look at the map where the, all these sick are concentrated, mark the map, then re deduce something about the nature of uh, the sickness. Perhaps this, can, this is the only place my novel may resemble White Castle. But, but, but actually, to, to follow up, I mean, just as a comment, the idea of um, scientific knowledge is important here in the idea oh, of yes. qu quarantine. And actually, it is um, correlated to state power. I would argue. Yes. I, I would a, a, okay. Yes. The, uh, in, um, <laughs> in, in, in the White Castle, the, um, um, the uh, information, science, uh, knowing lends power. So medical information also lends power to doctors. And here, Abdul Hamid was more listening to World Health Organization more than, I should tell, although he is a political Islamist, more than Trump. <laughs> 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 OK, then. <laughs> so, so I don't know if there's one burning question. Uh, oh, yeah, OK, go ahead. Uh, Umrah, Thank yeah. you for taking one oh, more oh, question. Sorry. Well, we'll, we'll take two. Okay, go, because I have to let Umrah ask you. Uh. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Can you understand me with the mask? Yeah. We understand, and we also see you. Back, <laughs> back to the subject of the eyes and seeing. I like what you have said about connecting people from different backgrounds. In literature that is written with a more modern subject. In the United States, the criticism is often leveled against the author as they don't know what they're talking about. They have not experienced this. How do you reconcile this yourself? Reconcile with what? With what? Uh, can I, I can paraphrase it if, if you want. Okay. So, Reconcile so, what? With what? So, so I think the question is um, uh, sometimes there's criticism of authors who don't have firsthand experience of something and, and, and write about it. I mean, how would you respond to that idea of... Maybe now that you had said um, United States and writers, who doesn't have any clue about United States and write a book about, I know someone like called Franz Kafka who wrote a book, 400 pages, called America. He'd never been to America. Hmm. <laughs> These writers are really strange. <laughs> so, Umrah, I think you are our last question. Thank you so much. Um, I just started reading the novel, so I've only read the first 20 pages or so. But um, I was already struck by the preface and I was wondering if you could say a little bit about why you decided to structure the book the way you describe it in the preface in terms of these letters having been discovered, um, and then there's you know, the female character who's interpreting these But letters. okay, then I'll tell you, in most of the novels, this is what we call a, a, is a sort of a frame story. Arabian Nights is also a frame story. Here, she is editing uh, purports to be editing many, many letters, while in Sheikh Razad is telling story each night so that she will not be killed. But in the end, don't, uh, her story is not that important. The story she tells is important. So I, I, uh, for me, I am perhaps a, a more modern than traditional 19th century novelist. When I have a story, I am like Henry James. I'm worried about who would see this story, who would tell this story. 
I can also write this like Balzac and Dickens. Someone is telling the story. The reader is guessing Balzac or Dickens is telling, but is not telling us directly, I am telling this story. So I could have done that. But for me, it's a technicality, a sort of an ethics of the craft that I should be self-conscious about who's telling the story. Uh, in fact, in my Columbia classes, I sometimes, who's telling the story? I terrorize the students. So, uh, so that they will be aware who's talking here. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes all great novelists mm, suggest, you know, we are, I, I thought Dostoevsky is possessed so much, the narrat narrator appears there only twice. He says we. Another uh, 400 pages passes, he says us. And then I ask, who is this? We is us. Everyone is terrorized. But, uh, <laughs> but it's a good way of thinking because we accept Homer. Uh, Homerus uh, uh, tells a story. We don't ask who tells this story. It's humanity is telling. He is hiding. But then in modern times, we want to be sure who is telling this story, or at least me as a novelist because I am that kind of novelist who is busy not only with the story, but with the way of telling the story, busy with the way to tell the story. Again, like Henry James, who will see that story is a problem for Henry James, but not a problem for Balzac. Can I just quickly, I was wondering if you were partly playing with the idea of how much of a historical novel it is, because you kind of bring how much? the question of authenticity. How much? What historical? How much of a historical novel it is, if you're playing with that idea? E yes, but some, you know, I have, a, I have a book called Black Book, which takes place in 1970, but I, I'm 80, more or less, but there is also very historical scenes in it. In the end, it's not that important whether a novel is exclusively historical or takes place in historical times. My, uh, this novel starts with, uh, in 1901 and ends in almost uh, 10 years ago. So it's both historical and contemporary. It's, it's sensibility. It's the academics who put this, who writes this story is very modern. Um, uh, but I'm, I tried to avoid speaking about coronavirus, pandemic, so forth and so on. So a couple of quick announcements. One, one, we'll be continuing the conversation tomorrow at the National Museum at 1.30. Uh, hope to see you all there. The second is, is because, of the, because of the threat of uh, pandemic. Uh, Orhan has signed uh, novels beforehand. A threat is a really dangerous world. Uh, maybe you sort of say it more softly. Um, so so uh, we won't be having any signings, uh, uh, personal signings. Uh, but I sign books. I know. The books are signed and they're, they're out front. People are interested. Uh, um, and uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.